Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Lighting in Redshift for Cinema 4D. The list of available light objects can be found under the Redshift menu. Let's start with a dome light. This light encompasses the entire scene. First of all, we need to apply an appropriate dome map that will be used as a light source. Currently, the contrast of your image is too high. We can decrease it from the gamma section. The overall brightness of light can be altered by changing its exposure value. High values will result in brighter light, while lower values will make it darker. Hue simply moves color values, but for most cases, that can remain unchanged. Decreasing the level of saturation generates a grayscale image. Higher values result in an oversaturated look, so we have to keep it between reasonable numbers. Sample values define the quality of your render. We will examine this aspect at the end of the lesson. The background image can be disabled from the environment section of our dome light. But we can leave this option enabled in order to define our own image that will add more visual interest to our render. Area light is one of the physical light types which has an actual size and shape. You can change its position to your liking, but it is worth mentioning that the process of manipulation will be faster if we switch to the clay render. That simplifies the shading. Color mode is self-explanatory. It allows us to set the desired color. While temperature colorizes light sources based on cooler and warmer values. We have already examined the texture component, that also can be applied to the desired light source. Alternatively, you can take advantage of Redshift's shader graph by executing the edit shader graph command. That will automatically fire up a node editor and assign the appropriate material to the selected light.
Unit type simply specifies the physical units to use for the light intensity. In most cases, we can stay with the default type. Decay type specifies the decay of the light source. When the decay type is set to none, no decay will take place. while linear decay allows us to manually define its falloff distance. For physically plausible results, it is recommended to stay with the inverse square type. The shape option specifies the physical shape of the area light. This can be seen when the visibility option is enabled. Most shapes are self-explanatory while the mesh type simply allows using arbitrary geometry as an emission source. The size option specifies the light's dimensions. Large sizes result in more light that require less intensity and generate softer shadows, while small sizes require more intensity and result in sharper shadows. The bidirectional option emits light from both sides of the shape when this is enabled. When disabled, a light will be emitted only from the z-axis. Normalize intensity prevents the light brightness from changing when the size options are altered. When this option is disabled, the light intensity will correlate to the light's overall size. A point light is another type of physical light. It emits light in all directions from an infinitesimally small point. Most of its settings are completely identical to the area light, so you can apply previous knowledge to this light type. However, Unlike area lights, the point light leaves very sharp shadows, so we have to manually specify their softness. Similar to point lights, the spotlight also emits light from a small point, but it creates a pool of light that has a cone shape.
It can be used to draw attention to specific parts of your scene that need to be more distinguishable. Cone angle specifies the angle of the spotlight cone, while the falloff angle can be used to define the transition between bright and dark parts of the light source. It is worth mentioning that the spotlight can be efficiently turned into a gobo projector by applying a desired texture. Volumetric effects can be achieved by creating an environment object and increasing the volume contribution scale of the desired light. Let's make the contours of this object more distinguishable by utilizing an infinite light, which generates a light source infinitely far away from the scene. Altering the position of this object has no influence on the lighting. However, we can change its rotation coordinates in order to define the direction of the emission. This type of light also generates sharp shadows, so we have to manually alter its softness. As you can see, infinite lights generate a very dark shadow that affect your matte plane. If you attempt to increase the shadow transparency from the matte section, its effect will propagate across all your lights. We are able to illuminate the shadow by enabling the Matte Shadow Illuminator option of your infinite light. Currently, the infinite light gives us acceptable results over the diffuse component. But if you'll check specular highlights, you'll notice that effect is too strong. You can completely exclude its effect over the specular or manually define its influence in order to get more appropriate results. Now it's time to clean up the noise in your render by increasing the number of samples. Disable all unnecessary light sources and enable bucket rendering in order to see the true quality of your image. We have to double the number of samples until we get a noise-free image. Lights with low intensity generate less noise and require a lower number of samples, while the light with more intensity generates more noise and requires a higher number of samples. Now every individual light object is optimized, and we can enable all light sources in order to see the final quality of our render. Thanks for watching.